Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by plants. plants. Today we bring to you episode 347, Brain on Plants and Sustainable Clothing with Zale and Stacy. In this episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk with Zale and Stacy from This Is Your Brain on Plants. You'll hear how Zale accidentally became vegan and how Stacy was able to rid herself of rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. We are sure that you're going to be shocked to learn about the amount of water wasted and the toxins that are polluting our world and our bodies with conventional clothing. So listen carefully to find out tons of ways to shop more sustainably and do more to help protect the planet, you and your family. This is your brain on plants is a sustainable clothing brand from Toronto and was founded by Zale and Stacy. Zale is a Grammy-nominated producer and songwriter whose resume includes Nicki Minaj, Chris Brown, Party Next Door, Meek Mill, and so many more. Stacy is a designer and creative, also from Toronto, with an equally extensive resume. Both are sustainability and vegan advocates in their own rights. Together, they launched this brand intending to bring a fresh perspective to sustainable streetwear and to help rectify the effects of fast fashion on our precious planet. All of the designs are printed on secondhand garments that have been carefully hand-selected. All the pieces are printed sustainably by using non-toxic, biodegradable inks. On average, each this is your brain on plants garment saves at least 2700 liters of water not to mention other resources commonly depleted by the fast fashion industry please share this out with everybody you know maybe on your facebook but for sure come join us on instagram and join in the conversation you have a huge collection of recipes but you never make them and you never even know what is for dinner. Things seem to kind of get out of control. You do your shopping, you hope that you're getting everything that you need, and then when four or five o'clock or six o'clock comes around, you're still scrambling to figure out what's for dinner. That used to be our life, and then I figured out the perfect system to make sure that everything was in order. I always had all the groceries that I needed, and that I was making nutritious food for my family without the headaches of the scrambles. So we created the Meal Planning Mastery so that I share all the tools tools that I use here in the Chain Plant Trainers Kitchen so that you have them to be able to create your own meal plans with your own preferences so that you are organized and life is just that much more simple. So you can find it on our website at planttrainers.com slash shop or click the link in the show notes at planttrainers.com. And now for a moment of gratitude. I'm so grateful for the people who I've been meeting with lately and getting to know. I really do believe that you attract who you are and that you attract people who bring you up in this world. And I'm just so grateful that that's my experience. I am grateful for our plant-based and vegan lifestyle that helped to reconnect us with our cousins that we hadn't spoken to in years. And that's actually who's on the show today. So we're super excited to share that out and uh, just so happy that we've reconnected with that whole side of the family. Zale and Stacy, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you for having us. So excited to be here. So excited. You are down in California with the sunshine. We're hibernating here in Toronto, but it's okay. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to see the sunshine on your side of the window. People can check that out on the YouTube channel to see the sun shining through. What are you guys grateful for today? You go first. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be speaking with you guys and that the vegan community brought us closer together. Yeah, yeah, thankful for, for outlets like yours bringing really important information to the world. And I'm grateful for the opportunity for us to be doing what we're doing. Yeah, I'm grateful that, that we've been brought closer together too. We won't keep any secrets around here. We're actually cousins, which is super cool. Adam and Zale are cousins and, you know, kind of distant in the family and hadn't seen each other for years. And then you checked us out on the 
Toronto Veg Food Fest website and you were yeah. like, oh my God, those are my cousins. I had no idea they were vegan. And, yeah. you know, you guys got in touch with us and it's been like, I like it's been great ever since reconnecting with all of you and also, you know, getting to meet Stacy and growing the movement together. It's great. 100%. Been, it's been so fun to get to know you guys and yeah, I feel like we're family and friends now and look at us. <laughs> <laughs> friends are better than family sometimes. Sometimes. 100%. <laughs> so most of our listeners already know my background and my story and why I got into the plant-based lifestyle and leaning into the vegan movement a little bit more. But why don't you guys share with us how you got into this type of lifestyle? Okay, I'm going to go first. Okay, so I got into the vegan movement kind of by accident. I had a lot of digestive issues growing up. I probably had an undiagnosed autoimmune disease. But I guess early in my 20s, I went to the doctor and got food sensitivity tests. And at the time, I was not really eating red meat. And I was not really consuming a whole lot of dairy. So the tests came out that I had uh, sensitive, like extreme sensitivities to egg, extreme ch- sensitivities to chicken, and obviously dairy. And most of, my, mo- most of my diet at the time was eggs and chicken. So I just started getting rid of all animal products and feeling a lot better just not knowing I was going vegan at the time. And what ended up happening was one or two times on the weekend, I'd go out with Stacy, and I would um, experience really bad nightmares that night, stomach pains, and then wake up with canker sores. So that happened twice. And then I was like, okay, I'm never eating animal products again. So I didn't really know I was going vegan. It was just an accident. And it was a great accident because it reversed a whole lot of problems that I was having internally in my digestion and in my stomach and how I was feeling. And it just, uh, I feel like it opened me up more creatively and just opened me up a lot more to bigger understanding of the world and our place in it as individuals in all of our actions. So that's my story. And I have a question on that. Yes. So were you already a little bit more organic at that point also? Yes. I feel like you everything grew up a, like without a microwave and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So everything was organic growing up. No microwave. Pretty like what you would think was healthy, like growing up, you know, not eating a lot of processed foods, not consuming a lot of white flowers or white things mostly, you know, whole ingredients, but not vegan. And it's made like organic meat, organic eggs, organic dairy. And that, that doesn't mean anything, uh, looking back at it now. That's still, you know, that, that even if you're eating organic animal products, there's still a huge issue with that, both to your body and to the environment and to those animals. I'm really glad that you saw those nightmares as a result of the foods that you were eating and not the time that you were spending with Stacey. Oh, that's funny. (laughs) Jury's still out on that, but we're still together for quite a few years later. So, (laughs) Yeah, so for me, it was also because of health issues. Uh, I sort of just ended up being vegan after a 20 plus year struggle with um, rheumatoid arthritis for about it was sort of the conclusion of a three-year food and lifestyle experiment that sort of just started with me like starting to feel a bit better on my own and so I was able to start weaning myself off of um, the really hardcore medication I was on and then because I was on less medication I was actually able to feel the effects of what I was putting in my body. I think for basically my whole life before that, I was just on so much medication that what I ate didn't feel like it was affecting me because there was like a a block there. And so, yeah, it was just basically like a three-year experiment where I just sort of started to like isolate different foods and actually be able to feel the effects of each of them. And it was right in line with the time when Dale and I started dating and just through him and his family being a lot more like in tune with sort of like health and and the body and all that kind of stuff it was yeah just like the amazing conclusion of that and basically immediately after going vegan I was able to fully stop all of the medications I was on and be able to start like exercising regularly without any pain and yeah 
basically just changed my life. And yeah. So definitely coming at it from a health point of view for both of you, but also mm-hmm. feeling very, uh, you, you, like what we've noticed is that you feel a lot towards the vegan community, towards the mm-hmm. animals, but more also towards recycling and low waste and life in general. And you're probably the first people that I knew that actually like bought secondhand clothes. And I know it, I know, I don't know if you still do, but at the beginning you were, you were actually like making your own style, Stacy, out of mm-hmm. all of these recite, like recycled clothes, like value village. I don't know what they call it down in the yeah. States, but you know, the, you know, where you have to rummage through racks and racks and racks to find totally. cool things. And I thought that that was totally cool, but I also had some reservations about it for myself mm-hmm. because it can be seen as, you know, you don't know who who it's coming from or where it's coming from and dirty and and things like that. So how did you get into those rummaging situations? How did I get into them? I think that's a good question, actually. How I got into them, I don't know. My brother and I always just like liked to go rummage at Value Village and more so back in high school it was just like let's see like the weirdest thing we can find it was less of like a whole lifestyle of like let's make my whole wardrobe sustainable but we just like loved to find like weird things but even still at that time I I was sort of actually still under the same sort of impression as you as like oh it's kind of like maybe like kind of gross to be like living in these you know like to make that your whole wardrobe but I think gradually I just sort of started, you know, getting things and like finding things that were actually like aligning with my style and figuring out how I could alter them, allow like a super unique style that was like completely my own because I was like making it, making these things um, sort of one of a kind pieces. Um, So that's sort of how I got into it. And Zale, you wear secondhand clothing too. When did that start for you? Yeah, as much as possible. Uh, Maybe like two three years ago i mean my sister avra has been a huge influence in that just like even in our vegan journey showing us the facts and the figures and she her and her boyfriend were probably they still are like really really into it and just giving the facts and the figures and showing us how important it is to shop sustainably not just in you know your food but also in your clothes so i think maybe like three years ago now two three years ago started making sure that everything whenever possible was secondhand you know what I mean obviously there's intimate stuff like underwear that you're not going to buy I mean they do sell them there but you know you're not going to be comfortable buying there but in terms of those I try to buy like sustainable underwear obviously so you could pretty much find everything secondhand and it's also cooler too it's bolder and you have more fits that are one of one so you're not wearing the same outfits that everyone else is from the same stores you can you know, be a little bit more bold and memorable, which is important in, you know, my line of business. So it aligned well. So talking about your line of business, and I want to get into, I'll put you on the spot for a roundabout stats and figures, or maybe if you have some of them after, but being in the rap industry and being vegan and wearing sustainable clothes and talking about sustainable underwear and all of that, how is that seen by some of your peers? And do you feel like, veganism and sustainability and all of that is becoming more important in the music world in general, people who have an influence on the rest of society. I think it's changing really quickly. I think like at first a few years back, like people were very defensive and would bring it up more than I would and would come at me for being vegan or try to make fun of me just like, you know, in a bro way. But I think like since the documentary rise on Netflix with, you know, what the health and Cowspiracy and now Game Changers and with so many prominent actors and musicians like Joaquin Phoenix speaking up about veganism, it's become something now that is everybody's very open to and wants advice on. And I've helped a lot of people in the space, you know, transition and go into a plant based diet. So I'm pretty grateful for that. And yeah, I think, I think the mood and energy of the whole plant-based movement has changed so much in the last two years, especially this year with Game Changers becoming such a big story and just Joaquin Phoenix speaking up so much and Billie Eilish speaking up so much and Miley Cyrus. So you have all these, it's like fashion, you know, it's like, it's now a fashionable thing, but this isn't something that will ever go out of fashion. This is becoming the norm. 
So I think in the last year, it's really just transitioned into a mainstream idea. And I think people now are, you know, a little bit, it switched. Like now people are uncomfortable with eating meat or talking about eating meat, you know, openly. It, 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 when people talk about it, it sounds like a guilty pleasure. Like, you know, when you speak to Omni people, whether it's in my line of work or in anything, they know for the most part that like this is detrimental to their health and to the environment. And they speak about it more as like a guilty pleasure than in the past where it would be like, oh my God, you're starving, you're vegan. You know what I mean? So I think it's very interesting and we're in, we're in a real great time seeing the transition because if people aren't all making the switch, I see a lot of people reducing and it, it's, it's in their brains. I heard, and I haven't looked into it, that the Academy Awards was a completely plant-based or vegan menu. Do you, do you see it going that way for the Grammys, maybe? Uh, I think right now with the Grammys, they got, uh, I don't know if you guys are following, but they have a lot of things going on, a lot of scandal. So hopefully that will be, but I think they've got some crazy, too much on their plate right now. <laughs> no pun them. intended. <laughs> yeah, there's like crazy scandals and stuff coming out and change of leadership there and I would hope that the Grammys take a similar approach next year but yeah they have a lot of other extracurriculars going on um, there's so many different role models out there whether it's athletics yep. or music or acting that's really having a huge impact combined like like you said with those documentaries that just came out the game changers and the other ones that the younger population is starting to really take hold of this, especially the millennials sure. who want to make a difference on the planet, the environment, the animals. You're totally on point, and I think it leads into what you're doing with your sustainable clothing, and I want to give you the opportunity to share with us a little more of the details as far as why you went in this direction and what you're putting out there to help contribute to changing our planet for the better because i think that's at the end of the day that's what all of this is doing and what the lifestyle is doing not only making us healthier saving the animals but saving our planet and that's the direction that i think this is really going to end up so if you would share that would be awesome yeah so like we were saying like we first started off going vegan we've been both in vegan for almost five years now and while you go on this vegan journey you you sort of start, or at least for us, we started seeing our impact in everything we do, not just in what we put in our mouth, but things that we purchase from like single use plastic to items that you would buy that could be harsh on the environment. So you start thinking of everything like what is the footprint? What's the carbon footprint attached to our actions? Because you notice with the vegan lifestyle that right away it's just like a gift that you see like, oh, just not eating beef, you're reducing your water in, intake and your use of resources, yeah, and rainforest destruction. So then you start coming to terms with, you know, clothing and understanding that clothing is very similar. Uh, fast fashion, which is your everyday place that people will buy stuff from department stores or from malls, 99% of the, the time that's fast fashion, that's produced in small countries like Bangladesh, India, China, places in Asia like Taiwan. And they, there's a huge human rights issue there as well as a resource issue. From the amount of water it takes to produce a t-shirt, it starts at around 2,700 liters, which is a lot of water. I think the stat is that that's as much water as a human needs to survive for 900 days. And that's one t-shirt. Mm -hmm. um, and jeans can be like eight, 9,000 liters of water. So it could be even more um, depending on the garment. So when you start looking at that and then taking a look in your closet or your purchases, and if you think about all that water and resources that were used, just on that perspective, it's huge. You know what I mean? If you were to add up your whole closet that, or your whole everything you bought that year, you'd probably be blown away. So and that's not to mention all the polluting because the dyes that they use to make clothing are, I think, the second biggest polluter uh, of all wat fresh water in the world. So, and that's all before we even talk about the human rights issues that have to do with fast fashion because these people are not paid fair wages in these small countries and the conditions are terrible and 
they're risking their lives and their body parts to make it's these garments. Children. Yeah, it's just all, all, also often children making these things. Well, I think I think that they're smelling they're smelling a lot of the they're inhaling a lot of the chemicals being used. So what is happening there? What kind of lung issues are happening? What kind of cancer is being there? Anybody who's seen Earthlings and please when you watch it, watch it with caution. Make sure that you could stomach it and don't blame me that you've watched it. But you know, they show in the leather industry at least these men that go into the pools of, I guess it's formaldehyde or, or to clean the leather to make it able to be used for handbags and trimmings on, on our clothes and what have you, they're losing their legs. Their legs are being eaten away at and then they have the legs amputated and what are they left with? They've been pay, paid unfair wages yeah. their whole entire yeah. lives to go inhale this stuff and lose body parts totally. and be disabled and not be able to provide for their family any further. These are the types of situations that we're putting people in when we choose our clothes. Absolutely. It's, it's completely unimaginable. Uh, like we're, we're just so lucky that in the Western world, you know, we have like the privilege to complain about not getting a lunch break. And here are these people who are losing their legs. I read an article about Indian cotton farmers where a lot of the a lot of the cotton for the world is grown in India and the amount of pesticides that they have to put on the cotton is outrageous and it's taking a toll on their bodies and they're becoming so depressed but it's like this cycle that they're locked into to make an income and they know that their mental health issues are coming from breathing in the toxic chemicals of the pesticides every day and they're actually committing suicide by drinking the pesticides to just end it like it it's yeah, it's unimaginable. And for us to just be like walking into the mall and like buying a $5 t-shirt, that goes into a whole other thing too. Like how much our clothes cost, well, especially for fast fashion. Like if you're buying a $5, a $10 t-shirt and you just think about how many hands that had to go through to get into the store, you know, we're talking about like maybe 15 people in the production line and, you know, that's not even a dollar per person, let alone the fact that they probably spent multiple hours each on, on that just specific thing. So there's no way that any of these people are being paid fairly, let alone treated fairly. The, con the conditions are obviously very poor. There was a few years ago a terrible, terrible incident in Bangladesh where the building that the textile production facility that all like hundreds of people were working in actually collapsed because it just wasn't even structurally sound and hundreds of people died. And, you know, and we're just over here like buying the clothes, like it's no big deal. So these things have to be pushed into the public eye and people just have to get smart about about all of it. Like like Zale was saying, it's not only a human rights issue, but the environmental impact it has as well. Fast fashion is one of, in, in the top five most polluting industries in the world. So there's just no way that in 2020, with all of this um, importance being put on the planet and its survival, there's no way that we can't take a look at um, the clothing industry and, and how we're consuming things. Something I wanted to add to just about the growing of cotton. This fact I thought was really interesting. Cotton farms cover 2.5% of the world's cultivated land, but use 10 to 16% of the world's pesticides. That's more than any other single major crop. So that's pretty crazy because what we have to remember about pesticides and the herbicides and insecticides that they're using is they get in, they ruin the, the soil and they also get into the, the, the runoff water and pollute and cause carcinogenic elements to the people in those communities. So it's just, it's not good. It's not good on many different levels. And the other thing that we, we wanted to touch on as well is the fact that 16 million tons of clothing and textiles are thrown away in America per year. And it can take, you know, 40 to 60 years for these textiles to actually decompose. And the process of them decomposing is also a huge environmental concern. So rather than continuing this pattern, we thought it was very important for us to look for solutions. And that's why we decided to focus our business on a circular economy opposed to a linear economy. And the circular economy, what it means is that things come back around full circle. So when you are taking items that were deemed for landfill and that already lived and had a lifeline, 
you're putting them back into a circular economy and giving them another chance to be worn and enjoyed by other people and hopefully other people after that opposed from, you know, starting from scratch and, you know, getting the, growing the cotton and starting from square one all over again. Our whole ethos is trying to create a circular economy and repurpose stuff that already exists and divert stuff from landfill and take stuff that's destined for landfill and turn it into new stuff that people can enjoy and wear the same way they would with something that they would purchase from a fast fashion or from a high-end fashion place. So that's basically what inspired and, and a little bit about why it's so important to us as individuals. I just wanted to jump in here for one moment. Hey patrons, we wanted to give you an extra shout out and tell you we appreciate how much you care. Because of your contributions, no matter how big or small, you've helped us to cover hosting and production costs as well as give a bright young intern a chance to work with our compassionate company. For those of you who want to help support the show, support learning opportunities for young plant-based students and compassionate causes, you can do so at patreon.com slash plant trainers or click the link in the show notes. And now back to the show. I think it is so important and bringing this awareness to everybody else, I really do think it's going to be more important to them as well. I want to put a pin right there and I just want to jump back. The pesticides that are being used on the cotton or whatever raw materials are being used to create these textiles, do you think that when they come to the store and we wash them once and we put them on our body that we're still absorbing those pesticides or do you think that they're gone or do you know anything about that? No, I think 100% you're absorbing them. Uh, there's people that have, I know people that are sensitive to those types of things and can't wear anything but organic cotton. So if there are people out there that are so sensitive, then it j just because you're not me or you or your friends are not specifically feeling anything, you, it doesn't mean it's not happening. And the other thing too that we have to remember as well is even with these synthetic fabrics, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the, with chemicals. the production of them and the chemicals that your body absorbs as well. So that's an issue. That's a huge issue as well. And also the microplastics that some of these new clothes that are made from synthetics, th that's polluting our waterways and our oceans as well. So we, we have to be so cautious about all these things and remember that just because you don't feel something or you don't see it in your everyday life s still means something's happening. Like... I think that's that's the most important thing to realize with fashion. So with this, I feel like there's got to be a huge educational shift. I mean, this is not something that I heard about growing up. I always just, you know, bought clothes from a store and whatever was cheapest is what I bought because that's what made sense to me. And for people to now stop buying the cheap t-shirt and move into a sustainable t-shirt which might be more expensive kind of reminds me of the fast food industry and those families or low-income families that need to buy like go to those fast food restaurants for those trios that are costing them under five bucks yeah. where cheap food is not good and good food is not cheap kind of yes, thing yes. it's like this is a whole educational piece that now we got to get people to shift into yeah, absolutely. I was nodding my head in agreement to all of that because, yeah, I grew up like the exact same way. Like if you were getting something cheap, like that was amazing. Like what a bargain, good job. And so, yeah, it's it's a huge swing and I think it is going to take a lot of education for everyone to sort of switch their brains that, you know, cheaper is maybe not always better. And I think that that plays into sort of our message of just slowing down the economic cycle that, that we're contributing to. I mean, even if, you know, it maybe it might not align with your personality to have every single piece of your wardrobe um, to be secondhand. But even just to think about maybe paying paying more for something that is going to last you so much longer, you know, buying a jacket for who knows, like whatever more expensive might be for you to last you, you know, maybe 10 years or maybe even more, like jackets can last a very long time versus buying something at like a super cheap fast fashion store where those garments are literally made to fall apart within the year so that you have to go buy another one. I mean, yeah, it's just... Yeah, it's, it's just a shame that it's like what you're saying with the fast food, like maybe not everybody can afford more expensive things. So 
you know, that's a shame, but I think that's where like thrifting can come into to play too. Like, th- you know, secondhand clothing is obviously a lot, a lot less expensive than brand new clothing, but just slowing down that life cycle and making decisions on when you're buying clothing to just buy things that last, even if they're not secondhand, if you're buying brand new, like what is the durability? How long is this going to last you? Is it, are you going to be, you know, getting rid of it within the year? So let me just kind of summarize some of the things that I've heard us Mm -hmm. say from the beginning to kind of make sense for the listeners and let me know what I'm missing. So we have, which we didn't say yet, but we have hand-me-downs and hand-me-ups, right? Getting those, those clothings moving within your families, extended families for the children or even for the adults, Mm -hmm. you know, like have a swap come together and like bring all your clothes and say, who wants this? Uh, We have the thrifting. Mm -hmm. We have buying from companies that either use organic or sustainable raw materials that are better for the environment Mm -hmm. that might cost you more, but are probably going to last a lot longer and aren't going to be putting the pollution into the the planet and into ourselves. And then we have recycling old textiles into new textiles, which I believe you do. And you'll tell us more about within your business as well. So paying attention to where the materials are coming from within companies so that you can make good choices. And I also heard Zale say that the ink that's being used, not just the fabrics themselves, Mm -hmm. the inks that are being used, you can buy organic inks and and things like that. So making sure that if you do have, you know, a child who's autistic or you have a huge autoimmune disease that's just not moving, paying attention to the clothes you're putting on your body mm-hmm. and how those toxins are affecting you overall. Yeah, absolutely. Also, the detergents you're, you're, you're using to wash your clothes. You Got to remember, like, these fancy pods, these, I don't want to say the companies, I don't want anyone to get sued, but these fancy pods that people are using to throw into their washing machines a lot of times those cre- can contain some microplastics that can pollute our waterways, but also they're loaded with chemicals that aren't good for your body. So I think it's very important that we choose natural detergents because if we're if these synthetic detergents are harmful not only to our bodies, but they're also harmful to our waterway, our water systems that they're going back into because I think it's something we're disconnected with. But even when we wash clothes, you know, the, the water goes somewhere. The water gets filtered out and, you know, you, it gets reused, reconsumed. So I think it's important for us to pay attention to what we're washing our clothes with. And one other thing that I think is very important and it's an easy way to be more sustainable in your everyday life is try to hang dry your clothes as much as possible. It, it not only will allow you to save money on your electric bill, but it'll also usually add more years of use to your clothing because the dryers themselves can shrink your clothes, can cause holes. Uh, so it'll prolong the life the lifespan of your clothing and it'll use less resources. So try hang drying whenever you can. Um, that's a very easy thing you can do. It'll save you money and it'll also be better for the environment and for the, the lifespan of your clothing. I know people right now are going, oh, but then it gets all stiff and it doesn't feel as nice. Do you have a solution for that? Do you need to like add something to the rinse cycle? Just get used to it. (laughs) Just get used to it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what we're doing. Like, yeah, shaking it out. I haven't found anything, to be honest, that makes it any softer, but I don't really mind. I mean, if you have the time to like just ironing things after can sort of like give it a softer feeling as well and just get that stiffness out of there. Just giving it a bit of... Put the kids to work. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, I think we're against that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then do you make your own detergents or do you just make sure that you're buying, you know, B-level detergents? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we sort of do two things. We do use a natural detergent that's plant-based and we also sometimes use soap nuts. I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but they're a literal like nut, I guess. Like it's a plant. Uh, they appear to have been dried, uh, but you can buy them and they're they're also like super economical. You can buy a whole box for like, I don't know, under $10 and you use like three or four of them in the, they, I think it comes, sometimes they come with a little like pouch to put them in your wash and they like suds up just like soap and clean your clothes like super well. I was really skeptical at first because I'm a stickler for having like clean clothes. Obviously, I'm sure most people are. I wasn't sure if they were going to work, but they totally work. Uh, and just those three or four that you use, you can use them like, I don't know, I think up to, yeah, like up to 12. 
12 times for a wash. So your, your whole box that you have bought of like, I don't know, probably 60 of these soap nuts lasts a super long time. So that's another really good, like economical and um, low waste and plant-based sustainable laundry option. Let, let's put that in our show notes at planttrainers.com and people could click on that link and we'll do some of that research and work for yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. So for people listening that now want to start thinking about looking at clothing differently and finding sustainable materials or detergents, yeah. what would they be looking for? Like how would they know if the clothing they're looking at has sustainable materials or ingredients in them? What do they need to see? What do they need to find? Yeah. So I think we're fortunate now in like 2020 sustainability, it's it's sort of good and bad. Sustainability is definitely trending right now. So companies want to be sustainable. So if a company is having like sustainable and ethical practices, they're going to be talking about it 100% on their website. So you can easily look up the brands that you're, you know, interested in, in purchasing from online. But the downside of sustainability trending is that there's a lot of greenwashing going on out there. So just make sure that when you are looking up these companies, even if they do have like a sustainable mission or like a sustainable part uh, to their their company, definitely like read everything and read between the lines if you are if you do care about that because I've gone on to research some brands where they they literally market themselves as a sustainable brand and you go to read about them and they're like basically it's so vague and it's like we have a mission to be sustainable by the year 2040 it's like okay well what are you doing now like just because you have an empty promise to do something in the future does not mean that you're doing anything now or you know they'll show graphs where they're like we you know vow to get half a percent better every year it's like okay I guess that's good that you're taking steps forward but there's so much more that you could be, you know what I mean? Like they're just trying to get away with the absolute minimum and in that calling themselves sustainable. So you definitely have to watch out for that greenwashing. But with that being said, if a company truly is having sustainable practices, they're going to be like shouting it from the rooftops because, and it's going to be clear what they're doing. You know, it's not, it's just, it's not rocket science to figure out how much people are doing and how little they're doing. So yeah, in that, definitely just do your research. People will be talking about it if they're doing something good. Obviously, like things like organic cotton or organic hemp, well, you know, that's automatically reducing the pesticide use on those things. So that is a big step. But it is surprising because even organic cotton, for example, still uses so much water and so much, so many resources, um, you know, like even if it's grown organically, it still has to be processed and dyed and watered and transported. So even that might not be like the most sustainable option, but it definitely is a step forward. It's a tricky business, I'm not going to lie, but I'm happy that people are thrifting a lot more and there are companies out there that are actually making real efforts to be actually sustainable and not faking it. And that's something that you're doing with This Is Your Brain on Plants. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how that was born? Love the name, love okay. the lo- love like the, the t-shirt and the logo that you have out now. I know that there's more coming. So tell us a little bit about how that was born and the types of things that you're doing to make sure that you're sticking with sustainability. So, okay, I'll start with the sustainability uh, aspect of that question first. The things that we do first and foremost is that And it also goes for people, too, with your last question. Thrift first. Try to find all your materials, first and foremost, secondhand. And that's what we try to do. So right now, the main major issue that we have in this space, because we're not big players, is that the technology for printing sustainably is very new. And a lot of brand, a lot of manufacturing operations are still learning how to do it. And printing on thrifted clothes is very difficult to do things. So that's a little bit of an issue for us that we're trying to overcome. And to give you an example of what we did, like with these jackets right here that we have, these are all secondhand jackets. They're U.S. military. And in order, we couldn't just directly print on them sustainably because the inks wouldn't hold to this, this specific fabric. So what we did instead is we purchased organic hemp which, and hemp is grown a lot more, uh, I think with half as many resources as cotton. So we, we got sustainable hemp and then we printed sustainably on the hemp using DTG. And that's how we did this. And that was our solution to repurpose 
this fabric and these jackets, which there are so many of them in the universe, and make stuff. We didn't go ahead and buy 100% new materials to create this. And then with our T-shirts, our most recent run of these T-shirts, we source them from defectives. So we found somebody who was an importer of shirts, and he was sitting with shirts that he could, a whole batch of them, tens of thousands of shirts that he can't sell, that he was ready to throw out because they were defective in a way, like the sizings were all wrong. Some of them, there were small holes on a bunch of them. Some of them had two different color fabrics on them. But what we found is that 30% of these shirts are still usable. So we spent days to take clothes that are in the, in the universe and repurpose them in creative ways. And we're still learning and figuring out what printing methods are out there that are sustainable but will last because our major issue that we're finding is that when you print sustainably, you have to do a lot of research because it's a new technology and a lot of printers say that they can do it, but then when you test it, it doesn't last. It's one or two washes and it's gone. So yeah, this is a new technology that we're trying to figure out and just create this circular economy and thrift first, find things used and repurpose. And Stacy can tell you the story on how the brand was born in terms of the name and the stuff. She had the brilliant idea. <laughs> yeah, our name was just a thought. Years ago, I was a little bit more involved. Basically, I just I had an Instagram page called Cured by Plants um, that was just about food and how I, how I was eating uh, with my vegan lifestyle to just support the health of my body against my rheumatoid arthritis. And I think at one point I was like organizing um, like a public sort of dinner party event. And I wanted to have like a photo wall there with a backdrop. And I think like recently before that, I had been reading about the 1980s and 90s, I think, like program that the American government put out against drugs that it was, and it was like, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. And they would be like frying an egg. And I just thought that was so interesting because I think it was like a Nixon administration or something. I don't know. And the whole sort of campaign backfired because all these like kids just wanted to do drugs more. Anyways, I just thought it was like kind of humorous that the efforts was like so poor and everybody like the opposite effect happened. And so I think that story was sort of on my mind and then it, the idea for like sort of the opposite of that of this is your brain on plants sort of just popped in and it just made sense like for that event which actually didn't end up happening but I, I still love that little like idea that I had and I kept it in a notepad on my phone for years and then when we started uh, thinking about um, starting this clothing brand um, that was just like that was still around and it still worked and it fit perfectly. So that was that was how, how our name was born. And yeah, like Zale, Zale was saying, our whole brand is sort of like our, our, our mission is to upcycle clothing so that people can have sort of the ethics and the morality of buying secondhand with the luxury of um, having like up-to-date trends and, you know, it, it will look like something that you purchase maybe like from the mall or from your, your other favorite or your former favorite store, but it, it's been upcycled and, and given new life from something old. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add to is it would be way easier to have done this without being sustainable. And I think a lot of people need to realize that when they're purchasing sustainable stuff. It's like if you're just creating a clothing brand and you're not worried about all these things, you can literally just point at stuff that you want and just not even think. And the catalog, it is, yeah, and have it all as cheap as possible. In order to be sustainable, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of research, especially this easy on, uh, this early on. And the one thing that I thought's really interesting is the thrift industry is growing so big right now. And I think that's a very positive thing in our communities and in our, in our culture. Um, I recently read an article that said in 10 years, the thrift industry is going to be worth $64 billion. And that's compared to the fast fashion industry, which will only be worth $44 billion. So the way we're trending, thrifting will be bigger than fast fashion in the next 10 years. And you, it is apparent when you watch YouTube and you see thrift flips and people going on thr uh, thrifting, like it's part of the culture, especially with younger kids still in their, their teens. It's just a big part of our culture. So for us, that also helped us and inspired us to get into this, is that like thrifting is, it, it's 
it's what a lot of people are into. So it's just good timing as well. Uh, and it's perfect that it helps our environment. So big news for me. Last month, I went to a thrift shop and I bought two shirts, a sweatshirt and a sweater. So I'm very happy that, you know, I'm starting to consciously make that effort. Cool. And this morning, Sage and I cut one of her old T-shirts that she wouldn't have otherwise kept because it's kind of like, you know, that just like a big cut on her and like not comfortable, but we kind of made it a little bit more stylish so that she has to wear it with a little sports bra underneath and what have you. So we saved that shirt by, by cutting it. So I wanted to share that, but overall I wanted to say so much respect for the two of you and what you're doing with your brand and how you are putting in all of that extra work. And it is harder, but you are doing it for so many good reasons. You're combining the plant-based community with along with this whole sustainability clothing. So thank you so much for what you're doing and your time today. If people want to check out your styles and see what's up and coming in your business as well, where would you like them to look? You can definitely follow us on Instagram. It's at Brain on Plants to stay up to date with new releases that are coming and tips on how to wear and style our items. And then our website is thisisyourbrainonplants.com. And yeah, that's where you can find us. Yeah, we'll link to those in our show notes at planttrainers.com so that people can make those purchases and check out that good stuff. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here. We love you guys. We're so happy to be reconnected with you and can't wait to see all the great stuff that you have coming. Likewise, likewise. And uh, we also want to offer you guys a discount for all of your listeners. If it's okay with you, we'll make the discount code plant trainers. For sure. Thank you. And all of your listeners will receive 15% off uh, their purchases when they type in plant trainers on obviously the discount code section of the website. Our website. Perfect. So we'll link to that in the show notes at planttrainers.com. And everybody should remember that there's two T's in between plant and trainers. One last thought I want to leave you guys with your listeners. Each year, the fashion industry consumes enough fresh water to fill 32 million Olympic sized swimming pools. So just want you guys to keep that in your minds. <laughs> it's a lot of pools. Podcast off. I challenge everybody to thrift one thing in the next month and post it on their Instagram and tag us at plant trainers and tag brain on plants and uh, let us know how you guys are helping to save the world. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you guys. You. Thank you Bye. so much. Take care. Thank you all so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. We want to make sure that you subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or any other podcasting platform. We really appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it really helps other people find us just like you did. Thanks so much to our patrons. To become a patron, visit us at patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference in the quality of the show and don't forget to connect with us on instagram and twitter our handle is at plant trainers like plant trainers on facebook join our newsletter and check out our website at planttrainers.com for awesome recipes a list of our services and of course our latest podcast we encourage you to email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so that we can help you improve your quality of life through nutrition and fitness so we hope we've inspired you today join us again next time and, and have, have a, a healthy, healthy day Day. Or is that too corny? It's a little cheesy.